I'm going to get us started. And okay. and we and a year ago we had part one of this conversation, and I shared the books and the writings of Michael Hudson. This year, I'm just going to be able to share bo this book. I wasn't able to share it last year. It's Temples of Enterprise. Um, we did. I I was I, I was honored and did a book review, and. Uh, and I really got into it. I really enjoyed it. I have a background in anthropology, and and this was um, this was wonderful stuff. And we're, we're going to have a wonderful conversation, a walk through time with Michael Hudson. And uh, I can't think of anyone else I'd want to do this with. And uh, I'm just really honored. We're all honored to be here with Michael today. So thank you, Michael, for being with us. Well, it's good to be back, and I see some familiar faces uh, there. Yeah, good. Okay, I'm gonna. I'll. I'll just. I can, I'll get us started, and. Um, but I don't. I don't think before we start with your questions, okay. I think I should talk about how uh, how uh, the, your questions lead in uh, to what uh, uh, Steve Steve was trying to Steve Zalinga was trying to do for many years. Well, we did that last year, I think. Yeah. Okay, then we don't have to do it this year. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. I think we'll just do the the rich history of the book, and and um, last year we covered you know the armchair economists and um, and we may come back to them in your book a little bit, but I think the real rich part of the book is to get early on in the history to. Um, to look what the wonderful things they can do. And I think from your perspective, they serve so much as an example. We have so much to learn from them. All and, right. And that's where I'd like to stay and focus uh, okay. as much as possible. So it, I, I would like to begin, Michael. I, um, I'm going to jump to chapters 9 and 10. But I want, I want to look at early urbanization. I like to go in chronological order, and we'll cover a bit of everything as we go. Okay. And um, um, I really enjoyed this book, and it, it woke me up to uh, my uh, graduate school readings. Okay, so let's, let's start. And around there, in one of the books, and it says, and, and um, Michael will appreciate this. Um, I don't have it in front of me, the quote, but I'm just going to give it. It's that the the armchair anthropo uh, the armchair anthropologists who, who are uh, sort of archaic in their thinking end up thinking, oh, you know, there's a bunch of individuals around, and they learn to barter <laughs> and uh, trade goods, and um, and the lesson from that was. Is that no? That never real. That can't even happen. And every individual is connected uh, to a community, and they need that community uh, to survive by, and um, you know, procreate to to count on things when you're sick and, and back and forth. So, community is essential. One of the one of the things my Eskimo father said when I was living living among Eskimos is. Why are you standing on that platform? And it was like we don't, we never want to separate ourselves from the group. It was a very strong value. So it's um, and David Graeber and others talk about this, and um, and there's only slight exceptions to it, and they're not real exceptions. You could talk about the TIV, the TIV, the TIV in Africa, and a few other groups. But they make it a ceremonial time to uh, to try to barter and debate a little bit, or to uh, to get a good deal on something. But it's uh, it's a cultural thing rather than a real economic thing, too. But anyhow, what we have happening though is people living in these alluvial plains where there's land is fertile and there's hunting, there's growing of grass. But so you have grass, you have animals. You have food. Uh, you may have back in those times, or very early times, around ten thousand years ago. You may have woolly mammoth and a mastodon and and other megafauna, but in time, the, those die out fairly quick, and you end up having uh, 
smaller game and the beginnings of agriculture. And around the Dnieper, along the river, the big river that cuts uh, Ukraine and has this east-west motion going on or flow to it, or west-east, um, east-west. And, um, and you have chieftains. Also, you have something else going on. You have these groups of people. And how do they organize themselves? They organize themselves with calendars and and other ways to 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 look at the seasons um you know to get a sense of uh of world water of their place in the universe and um so that would be a, a point of of where you have chiefdoms and you have the settling of the valley of the valleys and you have agriculture um and then michael i mean michael would you want to talk a bit about chiefdoms up there or or the you, you had a series of questions and are pretty good let's follow your questions okay okay well in your book you talked about um chiefdoms and the chiefdoms are organized along the Dnieper and they they're like uh lead people and you have like early urbanization you have sometimes communities up to several thousand people in these in these what, areas. Many, what time period are you talking about uh, about six thousand in any ukrainian uh archaeology uh, i know that uh, uh very around as you said twenty five thousand bc there there were ceremonial uh i think circular uh groupings that were uh, uh calendrically uh based but i really don't know the archaeology my specialist is, specialty is the bronze age near east uh mesopotamia uh it's it's not ukraine now that's uh, the uh the, the populations that came out of that area are a completely different area from uh, anything that i've worked on or written about okay then let then let, can we go back and can you talk a little bit about alex marsh check and your relationship to alex well i'm going to begin i'm going to follow the questions pretty much that you asked you mentioned fertile land uh before uh chieftains uh, there are so many different kinds of chieftainships uh, that, uh, that, but the key is that there is a, a, a group and they have one, one person or two people as a chief. One chief may be the war chief, another chief may be the calendar keeper, or the, these may be the same person. The chief that keeps the calendar also keeps the, uh, 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 makes decisions about war. Uh, but by the time we can pick up the story in uh, uh, Sumer in the third millennium BC, for instance, uh, the uh, 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 the great epics, uh, you, you already have uh, the uh, ch uh, war chief going to the uh, group of uh, teenage of uh, fighters in the army and saying, "Do you want to go to war?" Uh, that's how the epic of Gilgamesh uh, begins. Uh, but uh, the uh, Mesopotamia, Egypt, are not at all uh, well thought of as chieftains at all. Uh, you had the uh, in in place of the chieftains for one uh, a kind of uniform society. Uh, there used to be a book, awful book, called "From Chieftain uh, to Empire." as if somehow it all comes together. Uh, in Mesopotamia, you had a division uh, between the large institutions, the palace and the temples, set corporately aside from the communal base sector on the land. The communal base sector on the land with its uh, uh, or organization of families into clans, uh, they may have had chieftains, but uh, the overarching all, not overarching, but kept separately apart uh were uh, the temples and uh, the palace that were linked in terms of the large institutions and uh they uh, the, the scale uh, i think we should begin with what made mesopotamia so different from the ukraine and the difference was as you said alluvial soils uh and an alluvial soil means river deposited uh by uh the euphrates largely that's what made it very fertile but because that fertile soil 
didn't have metal in it, didn't have soil, uh, didn't have uh, stone because it was de uh, 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 delivered by, you know, deposited by the river. Completely different uh, from the Ukraine. Uh, and so uh, the uh, the result was that in order to get metal, in order to get stone, and even to get hardwood, Mesopotamia had to uh, get it from somewhere else, uh, from other lands. Uh, they went upwards, uh, largely uh, into Syria. They went uh, all. Uh, they, they traded with uh, the Indus Valley. Uh, much of the trade with them was on the island of Bahrain uh, uh, by, by ship. Uh, and they went uh, into what uh, basically what's modern Turkey, uh, and the the trade uh, basically consisted of temp of textiles that were war uh, woven in temple workshops and palace workshops by war widows and uh, war orphans, and sometimes by uh, purchased slave girls. The word for slave for uh, slave in uh, uh, in Sumerian was a mountain girl uh, that were were enslaved. These people were set uh, in uh, the, the 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 workshops to produce the temples, the uh, textiles, and what they wove. The textiles were then turned over to traders uh, to uh, take to uh, basically moving north and north uh, northwest up to up towards areas that they uh, could get. Um, the, the the tin that they needed that could have been traded uh, on, uh, by other groups on the way uh, to Turkey, uh, copper, uh, uh, stone, other things uh, that they needed. So they in uh, the the you had a bifurcated economy. You had the temples and the palaces and their associated merchants on the one hand, and then you had the great bulk of the population living on the land, producing the uh, uh, pr producing the uh, food uh, that they needed to feed the uh, the uh, the temple employers. Well, and because Sumer had to trade, it had to be instituted on a large scale. It had to be uh, uh, create. It had to. Uh, you, you needed to organize an uh, in, uh, industry of uh, weavers who were not part of the communal economy on the land because their husbands had been killed or maybe they got sick or uh, for whatever reason, they, they were set uh, set apart uh, under the rule of uh, the, uh, the, the ruler, whatever you want to call him. Uh, uh, divine kingship is one word for that. And, and uh, so this led to the requirements of uh, two, two kinds of, of mathematics. And, uh, and uh, if you're going to have a dependent labor force uh, to, to ma uh, make the weaving, how are you going to organize it? Well, you have to distribute food twice a day. The food was, uh, was grain. Uh, the, and there was an immediate problem. And it was a calendrical problem. So we're getting back to your connection with uh, Alex. Uh, until Mesopotamian and Egyptian times, uh, the, 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 you had a lunar, lunisolar calendar. Uh, you, in all of the great epics of uh, sort of a creation myths, th there was a problem. The, the, uh, the lunar year is 354 days. The solar year is uh, 365 days. There's a big gap. How, if you're going to distribute rations uh, and allocate them, uh, how are you going to, and the months are of different lengths, uh, because sometimes uh, uh, a lunar month is, may, could be anywhere from 26 to 30 days, uh, basically. Uh, you can't just change the food for that. The, uh, the large institutions had to create a standard, a standardized month uh, and a standardized year, a 360 uh, day administrative year, just uh, for the administration of the palace sector, the uh, the economy at large, with its holidays, the land, they 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 it was an annual calendar, but marked with by the uh, movements of the moon, uh, the the birth of the moon, uh, basically uh, was the key. So uh, uh, you had a separate calendar. Well. How do you standardize a 360-day year? You divide it into 12 months, 
uh, and uh, they come. Uh, if, if you have 360 divided by 12, it ends up as 30. So uh, the uh, the earliest account keeping and uh, fra system of fractions was uh, evidently designed for distributing food within the uh, uh, within these temple or palace workshops. Well, if uh, you give them a monthly uh, 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 allocation yeah. of uh, two cups of grain a day for 30 days, that means uh, you have a unit of 60, a bushel of grain uh, worked out to 60 sila. Well, that was the basic account keeping uh, methodology so that if you're uh, an administrator of a, a palace or temple, you have to figure out how much uh, grain do we need to distribute to this labor force to have enough to pay it uh, uh, so many bushels uh, per year, the 12 bushels uh, per year. Well, the result was uh, what's the 60 based sexagesimal uh, system of account keeping. There were 60 silas in a uh, uh, of cups uh, in a bushel. And that same system of fractions, once they developed an uh, arithmetic uh, system, they applied it to silver also. The foreign trade, uh, mercantile trade, wa uh, was uh, denominated in silver, not grain. Grain was for the domestic economy of the cultivators on the land uh, uh, and the, the grain that was used for distribution within the large institutions. So uh, this 60-based uh, uh, system was translated into silver. Uh, there are 60 shekels in a mina, just like there are 60 seconds in a minute. All that 60 base system uh, uh, that we have today all comes back uh, stems from uh, the Sumerians. Well, the um, this has a reference to the or the origins of money and the use of money uh, and interest, uh, be because if the denominations of money were shekels and minas, uh, then uh, when uh, you have people trading for silver, it's not like uh, sort of crazy people like. Uh, uh, the, the the idea that yeah, the commodity theory, uh, barter theory that used to be believed that uh, individuals would just sort of, some people had silver and some people uh, uh, produced grain or there were shoemakers. How do you pay for, how do you pay for things? You have to have denominations. You can't just pay a lump of silver for something. You had to have uh, a, a denomination. And uh, not only it was money denominated in silver, but uh, because it was divided into 60s, when it charged interest for silver loans, uh, the interest was uh, one a shekel per mina per month. Now, how did this work out? The uh, If you have a temple or a palace uh, giving a merchant a large consignment of textiles, essentially you'd give them, let's say, you know, the equivalent of $100 worth of textiles. You'd say, uh, uh, we want to share in the profits. How are you going to share in the profits? That the merchant makes. Well, uh, the merchants did not really keep account keeping of every transaction they did, uh, and if they would have kept them, who trusts? Who would trust a merchant then, just as he wouldn't trust a corporation today uh, very much? So the the basic assumption was uh, that uh, was that uh, the mina, uh, hundred minas uh, that they were uh, consigning to a merchant would double and become two hundred minas in five years. Any rate of interest is a doubling time. And given the arithmetic that the Sumerians developed for uh, uh, the uh, distribution of food within the temples and palaces, uh, that became uh, the arithmetic that was uh, uh, used for calculating the rate of interest, which really was sort of uh, a, a profit share, uh, sharing deal. So uh, that, that was the uh, calendrical basis. Well, every uh, uh, other countries. Uh, that were much more in the character of chieftains, like uh, say uh, Italy uh, before uh, before it had contact with uh, the East in the eighth century uh, BC. Uh, the Italian means of uh, denominating fractions was based on twelfths, obviously because they're twelve months in a year, uh, and so one twelfth is uh, eight and a third percent interest. So you can see that the rate of interest 
uh, was based on the calendar. Uh, Egypt and Crete uh, and uh, 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 Greece used the decimal system, 10%. So their uh, rate of interest could it could be one percent per month or it could be ten percent a year. It was it was all decimalized. Everybody's rate of interest and the denominations of their currency was all based on the arithmetic uh, system, the fractional arithmetic system that they have had. And uh, this uh, I think uh, this leads into the point that I think you wanted to begin with was the the organization of arithmetic, of uh, division of society into tribes, 12 tribes, or else four tribes or six, they all had to uh, dovetail into uh, the 12 months of the year. If you had a uh, like the Athenian and Amphic- the Greek amphictyonies, of, uh, there were going to be 12 tribes. What did that mean? There was a large unit. The large unit was divided into 12 parts, and the head of each tribe would uh, rotate during the year so that every tribe was able to uh, sort of uh, be the chairman of the uh, the uh, overall tribal meeting that would take uh, place once a year uh, based uh, on, on the moon. Well, you mentioned Alex Marshak. He pointed out that the very beginning of... Uh, of thought of conceptualization really was the calendar. He found that already uh, from the uh, 25th century, 28th century BC, you have chieftains carrying calendar sticks. The calendar sticks he found were bones of animals that were, they would carve and inscribe them uh, with, uh, they keep a track of the days so that uh, you would know uh, when uh, the moon was going to come, and it was very important to know when the uh, the new moon would be, uh, or the full moon probably, if you want people to get together. Uh, if, if if it was uh, the full moon at a key point of the year, that meant that your group was going to come together with other groups, and you'd all meet uh, together at this calendrical time. And so each of the chieftains in each of the subgroups of however large a a uh, population group we're talking about could all come together for meetings. And Alex found that most of the this calendrical art was found uh, in uh, places that were well, there frequently on rivers or where there was a, uh, a, a, a people pa- uh, cr- uh, river crossing or uh, some other uh, trade related place because the whole purpose of getting together uh, of uh, archaic society was either to exchange gifts uh, or ex- exchange women uh, and or arrange marriages and uh, intermarriages when uh, people were expected to marry outside of their their tribe. Uh, the whole organization of society was uh, based on the calendrical uh, divisions. Uh, uh, very early, it was noticed that there were uh, 12 tones in the musical scale uh, before there was a repetition. Well, music and the calendar had to, went together. And just as the lunar and the solar year were about out of sync in music, you had the, what's called the Pythagorean comma, which is really, a, a, it was, there was nothing Pythagorean about it. It was a Babylonian. Uh, uh, you'd have that. So uh, a- a- Alex traced how, uh, he traced how did this organization of thinking that uh, began in the Paleolithic, how did that uh, end up evolving into the uh, the Neolithic and from the Neolithic to the Bronze Age. And uh, that that basically is uh, what he did and that guided most of the uh, work that I did with my Harvard group when we were writing uh, the economic history of the ancient Near East. Uh, we were tracing it all the way back to the uh, uh, to uh, the Paleolithic. And uh, it actually, it was Alex who uh, brought me uh, up to Harvard, and uh, he got me appointed uh, there with the Peabody Museum, where he worked. Uh, uh, and so our, our, we overlapped, and Alex wrote uh, the, the wonderful idea uh, article in uh, the uh, our, our book on urbanization uh, and land use in the ancient Near East. And uh, Alex found out and he, he he realized that uh, when these groups came together, uh, that people used to call them the first cities because they would be large ceremonial uh, 
creation, something like Stonehenge, but not Stonehenge, but other uh, 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 calendrical alignments. Well, they weren't like modern cities at all. Modern cities are uh, basically controlled, uh, they evolved uh, by chieftains, but uh, they're, they're states uh, but, uh, th that are administered. But the ceremonial uh, meeting places were anti-states. They were they they were uh, way down into uh, classical Greek times when people would go to the games. Uh, that was sort of the follow up of, of the uh, uh, the uh, the Paleolithic meeting. You'd go to the games where everybody would get together. Uh, it would be market. It would be exchange. Uh, they would be immune from uh, military uh, attack by other tribes along the way. It was realized that these uh, uh, these uh, ceremonial centers and were, were like amphictyony centers. They were administrative sectors set aside from the chieftainships, aside from uh, the rest of society, just like uh, the, uh, the large institutions in Mesopotamia had been uh, uh, set aside. So uh, I'm not sure how we uh, uh, relate all of this to money, but money was uh, stemmed from basically account keeping. Uh, if you if you had to have a, a large uh, amount of people uh, employed uh, and turned over to uh, traders, uh, the traders were in the silver economy. Uh, you had the uh, lab labor based on the uh, agricultural economy to feed them. You had to integrate them. And that's why they made a shekel of silver equal to a bushel of grain. And uh, that uh, enabled them to have a consolidated uh, accounting uh, for, uh, for the year. This goes right down into uh, the uh, late Bronze Age uh, Greece, the Mycenaean Society of Greece uh, uh, and uh, Egypt. In Egypt, you would have uh, the records from the pharaoh's time uh, listing each region, each district, uh, and here is how much uh, you expected uh, each district to be able to pay in grain under normal circumstances. Uh, if there wasn't a flood, if there wasn't a war, if there's something else. And uh, you then would, uh, the British Museum has uh, one of these documents you would have. Uh, they, they filled out uh, all of the, pro uh, the projected income uh, the and production of grain uh, for the year uh, in black ink. And then if there was a shortfall uh, from what actually was uh, uh, turned over uh, to the Pharaoh's economy, that was in red. So our practice of red ink goes way back uh, to this uh, forward planning uh, of uh, the, the Egyptian economy. Well, similar things uh, were uh, made in Mesopotamia. Uh, the, all these economies were credit economies. People didn't really use money uh, during the year at all, uh, because uh, if, if money was grain, you're not going to uh, carry grain around in your pocket. Uh, it gets sort of moldy that way. So uh, when we have uh, we have contracts that are due in grain, uh, they all are very clear. This grain is to be paid on the threshing floor. Money was only used once a uh, a uh, a year or once in a, se a, a growing season. And uh, dur during uh, that year or during the uh, accounting period, uh, you'd have uh, Sumerians go and visit uh, the alehouse. And we uh, and they'd go to the alehouse and uh, they'd literally run up a tab, just like in modern times. The tab would have to be paid on payday. And their payday was when uh, the... Uh, uh, the, the crop was harvested and they would bring in their grain that they'd harvest and they'd uh, put it, uh, measure it out on the threshing floor. And when it was measured out on the threshing floor, uh, uh, such and such uh, an amount would be paid to the alehouse, such and such to whoever they'd owed money to during the year. It could be a priest who was officiating uh, at one of the private uh, uh, functions. Uh, it could be uh, they, it would be m money owed to the palace uh, economy for the advance of agricultural goods. It could be paid uh, to individuals. So uh, uh, you you had uh, money being sort of a settlement time in an overall credit economy. 
that's what most monetary historians leave out of account. Uh, that's one of the things that uh, uh, led Steve uh, to place such great emphasis on uh, Steve Zarlinga, to place such great emphasis on the fact that money was a legal uh, construction. Uh, it was a measure of uh, valuation uh, for exchange. And uh, if the the uh, tr the equality of one shekel per silver for one bushel of grain was for payments to the uh, the large institutions. Now, the actual price of grain in terms of silver might vary uh, in the private economy, uh, as a private in the communal uh, family-based economy on the land. But uh, in order for this not to derange the accounting system of the uh, large institutions, uh, you, you had uh, the, the credit uh, one credit economy for the large institutions. This was emulated or imitated by uh, uh, private merchants uh, and or big men in the uh, uh, the communal sector. So again, you have this division of the economy. I won't say public and private because uh, the large institutions, the palaces and the temples were something, they weren't really public yet. They were corporately set apart, not, not part of the whole economy. That uh, really occurred only in the West. It wasn't part of, uh, after uh, uh, the Bronze Age ended uh, 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 by the time we get into classical uh, antiquity. So, uh, Michael, Michael, let me just ask a quick question, and I want to go forward. I don't, I don't want to go too fast. I want to. Um, we spoke about uh, widows, and the widows would have children, and it, you describe a scene where the children come on board, and then they can work in the uh, palace pastures nearby, and they can contribute, and then it's the why it's the the mothers who can then use that wool and, and make the clothing and then they can use it to trade with the with with the people and could you describe too then early on would there be attempts at wars and then when does war stop and you know how does that compare to trading can you want to talk about that a little bit well already in in the fourth millennium bc you have Uruk, which was the largest city in Sumer. Uh, you had, uh, uh, archaeologically, you found military outposts uh, uh, in the north, uh, uh, as we say, up towards Syria, uh, going up towards Turkey. For about 200 years, you found these uh, military uh, settlements. And apparently, the, uh, there was a, an idea of the Sumerians that, well, let's go out and let's uh, let's just uh, do what Americans do in Latin America. Let's just go uh, take the uh, mines over uh, and get them. Uh, they found that this is very uh, this is a, a long supply line uh, for uh, for military troops as well as for goods, and that uh, it didn't pay. That uh, let's have a peaceful relationship. It's sort of uh, uh, the difference between uh, uh, the BRICS countries today trying to have a peaceful uh, mutual gain relationship and uh, uh, the NATO countries saying, uh, do what we want or we'll, uh, uh, we'll fight you and blow, and, uh, uh, blow you up. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the Sumerians uh, created a trade network so that uh, that's why uh, instead of just fighting and uh, uh, sending some uh, Sumerians up to start a mine and producing things or chop down trees themselves, they had the locals do it. Uh, and uh, the traders would form a like a chamber of commerce, all, always centered around a temple that they would create as their chamber of commerce in whatever uh, region, uh, or, or I, I don't want to say city, or, but whatever region or center uh, uh, they were in. And uh, they developed uh, a, basically a peaceful relationship. The fighting was uh, primarily among Mesopotamians themselves. Uh, uh, for uh, uh, who would uh, take over. Uh, but of course, you, uh, you had the great big fight and transition was uh, the Sargons, uh, Akkadians, uh, 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 basically, no, uh, uh, I won't say nomad, uh, nomads, uh, but a, 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 a whole different ethnicity uh, that came over. And we have the records from the Babylonian times uh, essentially saying, okay, uh, we're, going, uh, we're going to assign them such and such cities, and they can have these cities, 
we'll have ours. That's just exactly what France did in the 9th and 10th centuries when the Norman invasions came into France. Uh, the Normans, uh, the French said, well, what are we going to do? We don't want to have these Normans fight us. Let's just co opt them all. Let's just uh, uh, make uh, give the Normans Normandy, and they'll be in charge of Normandy, and that will say, oh, you're part of France, uh, you got to convert to Christianity, so you're, you're, you're part of our church, and now you're one of us. Well, that, that sort of happened in Mesopotamia, uh, uh, but, and that was part of the fighting, but also within uh, the southern Mesopotamian cities, uh, you'd have fighting. Uh, Hammurabi uh, was uh, very often fighting uh, other cities. And uh, when they would, would go to fight, fight uh, the problem then is this would interrupt the harvest, uh, basically. So uh, when there was, uh, uh, after uh, Hammurabi defeated Larza, uh, what did he do? He wanted to make peace with uh, the neighboring uh, city of Larza. Uh, whose leader had attacked him. So he canceled the debts for everybody. That made uh, that won the hearts and minds of the people. Uh, by canceling the debts of Lard Larger, uh he did what he'd done for his own people. Every Sumerian and Babylonian Near Eastern ruler, Egyptian, uh, upon taking the throne, would start a whole new uh, accounting period, a whole new uh, epoch. And uh, that would be just like in England, uh, the, the calendar used to be such and such a year of uh, King George III or Queen Elizabeth or who, uh, whoever it'd be, they would be named after uh, the ruler. And uh, the, the rulers all begin the first full year of uh, their uh, reign, which is called the second year, uh, be, uh, because there had to be, uh, the first year was sort of only, not a full year because the predecessor had died. Uh, they'd uh, declare a clean slate. That is, they would cancel the personal debts uh, of uh, the cultivators, not the silver debts owed by the merchants. The merchants were separate from all this. Uh, uh, they they didn't have their crops destroyed. Uh, so the, you would cancel the uh, debts. You would also liberate the bond servants who had to uh, work off their debts to uh, uh, the creditors uh, that had uh, built up over time. And you'd return the land to uh, uh, and the crop rights to any debtor who had turned over the crop rights to uh, the creditor. Uh, as, as well, so uh, literally, the uh, these uh, the world proclamations of Hammurabi uh, cancel the uh, uh, the grain debts uh, of, of the people, uh, free liberate the bond servants, and uh, redistribute the land to uh, their original holders. This is exactly what what the uh, returnees uh, from uh, Babylon did when they returned to. Uh, uh, Judea, and uh, they they uh, made this. They wrote this into uh, the Bible that was being uh, compiled, uh, essentially by uh, uh, you, you. You had Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra basically was apparently overseeing this rewriting, and they put this uh, uh, clean slate in the very center of Mosaic law. Uh, in Leviticus uh, 25. So you you had this uh, ability to say, we're not, if, if the crops fail, or if, uh, if there's a flood, uh, Hammurabi's law says, if the storm god added, uh, Adad, uh, uh, devastates the land and you can't pay the crops, nobody has to pay the debts, because obviously, if you had to pay the debts that you ran up, during the year in our credit economy, then uh, all of a sudden uh, you'd have the whole population falling into debt to their creditors who could be uh, collectors in the palace bureaucracy, could be individuals who would advance uh, uh, animals to help with the cultivation or priests who'd uh, perform wedding ceremonies or burial ceremonies. Uh, you, you would have an oligarchy developing. And the result of these clean slates in Mesopotamia was to prevent a an oligarchy from developing that would have ended up uh, ganging up and overthrowing uh, the ruler as they did in uh, the classical antiquity so that they couldn't cancel the debts uh, anymore. So that's a byproduct of uh, this, the whole idea of account keeping in a way that uh, you, you want to uh, create some form of stability. And the basic assumption of uh, uh, of the the uh, let's call them the economists in Babylonia. They were the scribes. We have the textbooks 
that the scribes were taught, uh, uh, were taught. Uh, uh, and they were all they translated first into French, and now they're all in English. And uh, the uh, the rulers had an economic model that is more sophisticated than any model used by the National Bureau of Economic Research or anything that I was taught uh, in uh, graduate school about business cycles. The uh, the first thing scribes are taught was how long does it take uh, an interest bearing debt to double? Well, the answer it was five, uh, five uh, 20, uh, one shekel per minute, uh, 12, uh, 20% uh, per year, five years, simple interest. Uh, they did not permit compound in, compounding of interest to, uh, of debts to occur, uh, five years. We also have, so we knew that this is the sweep of uh, uh, creditors lending out money. They, we also have uh, the ability to pay. We have uh, the model for what is the, how fast does a herd of cattle grow uh, uh, and expand? And it's an S-curve. It tapers off. Uh, and when these uh, statistics, these uh, learning exercises were first found, uh, economists thought, well, this must actually be a, uh, a record of what actually happened. But then they found out, no, uh, these were actually training exercises. They knew that the economy grew on the S-curve, but debt grows way up, and, there's, and debts grow faster than the economy can pay. So the uh, Mesopotamians knew something that uh, is denied by all modern economists, but should be at the very center of every economic course, that debts grow faster than the ability to pay. And obviously, when that happens, one of two things happens. Uh, either if the debts grow faster, either the uh, debtors fall into bondage or they forfeit their property, their land and their, uh, their cattle or their assets or whatever they have to the creditors like today. Uh, or you say uh, it's more important to preserve social continuity and prevent economic polarization uh, and to prevent the emergence of a uh, an oligarchic class uh, that's going to act for itself and do what they did in Rome uh, and, and just uh, uh, impoverish uh, the economy uh, as a whole. So uh, essentially, this is how the uh, Sumerians sort of had a world view. They knew that uh, the economy tended to get out of balance. There was no concept that you have now a self-regulating business cycle that's sort of like a sine curve very smoothly up and down. They knew that there was a, a tendency for there to be uh, a buildup and then an interruption. It could be war. It could be uh, a, a, a drought. It could be a flood, as I said. Uh, but, but they knew that that was a fact of nature, and they weren't going to let these interruptions of the real economy, the uh, agricultural production, uh, d uh, lead to a uh, social dependency system. The whole idea of leaving uh, a free, self-supporting agrarian class was so that the, the uh, uh, they could meet the terms of their land tenure. Uh, and this leads naturally in, into uh, land tenure. Uh, we, we, we first find land tenure emerging in the late Neolithic. What would be happening? Well, uh, in Mesopotamia, uh, we know what happened. You would have uh, a, a, a group of citizens. They would all be assigned a similar plot of land. Uh, and if it was a river, a muddy river deposited soil like uh, Mesopotamia, it, sometimes it wouldn't be the same land. It would always be uh, uh, similar uh, uh, in, in size. And uh, they, they, they were assigned land tenure in uh, proportion to their ability to pay, we can call it taxes. Uh, but the taxes they had uh, before the economy got fully monetized was, number one, they had to serve in the infantry, uh, and they had to serve in the army uh, if there was a war. Uh, and uh, they had their equivalent of the House of Representatives was uh, the group of, uh, uh, of fighters. That, again, is how Gilgamesh uh, convened uh, this uh, democratic group uh, to judge uh, whether to go to war. Uh, and you could say that uh, the, the, they also had to work uh, during the year uh, when the crops, uh, when it was not necessary to plant or harvest crops, that's when they would work on 
corvée labor. That is the labor that they owed to the palace. They didn't later, they were able to pay money to the palace to hire workers to do this labor. But before the economy was fully monetized, they had to uh, do it themselves. Well, this this is uh, puzzled historians. How on earth are you going to get people to uh, somehow uh, do what we see? Pictures of people carrying big sacks with uh, uh, stones in them and rock, big sacks of uh, all sorts. Of, how are we going to get people to spend a few months uh, work building these uh, uh, city walls or temples or uh, the big constructions that we have. Well, uh, they they had it. I won't say it was one long beer party, but uh, when Egypt built the pyramids, we have the actual distribution records for how they uh, provisioned uh, the builders of the pyramids. They were, uh, for Hollywood version, uh, is that, oh, they were all slaves, like the Bible describes the uh, uh, the Jews being slaves. Uh, building the pyramids in uh, Egypt. That's a lot of crap because we know who built the pyramids because they wrote often in hieroglyphics, you know, we are the uh, engineers from such and such uh, uh, town. We are so and so from the, from this town. We know what they were fed. They were, f f they were fled uh, good food, plenty of beer, and most important, uh, uh, there were key feasts during uh, this period of uh, uh, working on uh, uh, on public infrastructure, uh, where they had meat in their diets. They had better diets, and, and uh, it was like one big, long party. Uh, and this was essentially how they built a loyal citizenry. Uh, yes, you're, this is the city. These are the temples. These are the palaces that, and walls that you built. And uh, you, sh uh, uh, you had a great time building it. Uh, you, you met friends, uh, met, made new friends. Uh, Etc. This was the big socializing uh, experience of uh, the, the Bronze Age Mesopotamia uh, and Egypt, uh, and it was uh, it was all sort of pl planned and allocated by account keeping. And uh, one of our, our volumes, uh, creating economic order, uh, from the Harvard meeting that we had in. Uh, uh, the British Museum in London uh, all describes how account keeping led to the organization of society. Uh, and I know your point was, well, the account keeping was based on the calendar, uh, just as uh, uh, how our Alex Marshak said, uh, uh, Paleolithic society was organized on the basis of the calendar. Well, uh, uh, you, uh, you had the, uh, what began is an organization of the calendar ended up as a uh, a fiscal organization uh, of uh, the Bronze Age, uh, an uh, organization by by the accountants, uh, you could say, that sort of determined uh, the organization, overseen by uh, a ruler. And uh, the ruler was not like it would be in a chieftain-type society where uh, uh, by uh, classical times, uh, the leader would try to get rich at the expense of uh, the subjects uh, in almost all the anthropological studies. If a chieftain tried to get richer than others without using his wealth open-handedly to help the uh, community, then he'd be deposed. Uh, and uh, uh, certainly you already had in the Bronze Age, if a, a ruler didn't cancel the debts, uh, you, you'd you have uh, his citizens, they'd run away to a, another locale uh, where you had a ruler who did cancel the debts. Similar things happened all through Italy in the seventh uh, uh, and sixth centuries BC, when all uh, all uh, you had mafiosi type uh, chieftains. I think the the, the word mafia mafia uh, chieftainship has been used often uh, for uh, the Greek and Italian. Uh, Ma Michael, Michael, I just want to I want to go back a little bit, and I want to make sure we get this key concept down uh, that. You've just so well described, and I don't want to lose it. And to help people put it in their minds, I want to give a little bit of a timeline between early bronze and the middle bronze age and what's going on. And um, early on, yeah. we have this big learning period that you've just beautifully, beautifully described. And there's great learning lessons. And then in the middle bronze age, so early on, we could say 3500 BC to about 2200 BC. That's a 1300 year period. 
and, yeah, and, and what what made the middle Bronze Age middle? Uh, you had all you had all you had fighting. All of this fell apart. A, a middle it's called the intermediate period, and an intermediate period is everything's up for grabs. And all of a sudden, uh, by the middle, it began around 2200 under Sargon, of course, but really it was uh, 1800 sort of signaled uh, uh, the Middle Bronze Age. All of a sudden, you have uh, the emergence of uh, more of a privatization of credit. You have the emergence of a creditor class. You have less of a, uh, a unified communal society, and you have an overlayering of uh, one ethnicity, uh, uh, the uh, Semitic uh, 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 ethnicity over the Sumerians and the Sumerians had were multi-ethnic society uh they had uh, uh whoever they nobody knows who the original Sumerians were but it, it's even suggested that they could have been Khmer they could have come from uh the from Cambodia for all we know they could have come from the east uh, uh so there were many ethnicities that all had to get together, and it's been hypothesized that the origin of writing itself came, how do you, uh, when people speak different languages, how do you develop a system of writing that they can all communicate in? Uh, so uh, what was a uh, well-organized multi-ethnic society uh, ended up uh, in an increasingly warlike society uh, that sort of en ended uh, when the weather got really bad in 1200 BC, and all from the Middle East, uh, I should say West Asia, uh, all the way to the uh, Mediterranean, to to Greece, Mycenaean society, uh, you had ma you had um, what seems to be a massive drought, and that put uh, populations uh, around 1200 BC uh, in motion. So uh, you're right; it's it's very important to layer uh, these uh, uh, these uh, archaeological periods chronologically, so you have an idea uh, of what is it that changed during each of these periods. It's not simply we're looking at the calendar and uh, here it's January and now it's February. We're talking about each of these changes uh, in a period as a change in the social organization, the focus, and above all, the or, uh, the how a society treats uh, money and credit uh, and, and debt. Uh, that in a way you could say that the way of defining any society from West Asia to uh, uh, classical antiquity to China uh, to uh, the modern uh, fight between the, uh, the BRICS countries and NATO, how, how do they handle money and debt? Uh, and each of these periods has a distinct monetary uh, and uh, uh, relationship between creditors and debtors. Uh, from the the original system was the state being uh, the credit, the, not the state, because it really wasn't the state. It was from the large institutions being the creditors to uh, later on being private individuals being creditors. And private individual creditors do not uh, uh, treat uh, the indebted population uh, as a, a population to be kept free, but as a population to be reduced to bondage, as happened in Rome. Well, Michael, let me let me put an exclamation on that, and um, and let's 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 just cover these. I'm going to read from your book on a page 159. My two, uh, and these are two Roman historians at the time of Christ. Interestingly, that um, um, their uh, Virgil is 70 to 19 BC. And uh, um, and Seneca, I don't have his dates right now, but he, here's the two quotes: two Roman historians, Virgil and Seneca, and um, and who's saying whom? They they depends on what translation you get, and they they say it a little bit uh, different. Um, but here here they are: no plowman, no plowman tilled the soil nor was it right to portion off the boundaries of property. Men shared their grain, and earth more freely gave her riches to her sons, who sought them not. Well, this is the idealization of a golden age, uh, and that's not exactly what happened. Uh, David Graeber, his, uh, who you mentioned earlier, uh, has said that, yes, there are many societies that did try to uh, maintain equality, but it wasn't that individuals 
just did all of this. Uh, uh, it was this was organized and socialized, uh, and there usually was an uh, overseeing authority uh, that was uh, trying to make sure that uh, there was no uh, uh, private that uh, if there was private uh, greed, it wasn't going to destabilize uh, uh, things. That that that's the basic. A uh, principle, now, and we know that uh, the whole principle of gift exchange was uh, everybody uh, would uh, uh, sort of unify their families by I'm going to give here. I've just had the harvest. Here's my uh, here have have a bushel of grain, and then uh, the family would give them the equivalent of a, a bushel of grain back. They they'd be changing the same thing. The idea was I'm giving you, you're giving me. Uh, the idea of uh, what became debt was a, a mutual obligation. The debt was uh, uh, not aimed at uh, creating a surplus that would result in dependency. Debt was just the opposite. Debt was a unifying system uh, in uh, what was a golden age. Uh, uh, Virgil wasn't aware of uh, all, all of the archeological and anthropological details of this. Uh, but he somehow he knew that in this period, it wasn't always this way, that uh, Rome had been a falling away from something. And uh, uh, he knew it because there had never been such selfishness and greed. Uh, it was uh, almost as if the Romans were modern American banks and corporations. They wanted to get uh, to uh, take something away from you. It was exploitative. They, they were so, rent seekers. So, somehow I'm wondering... Uh, Michael, back then, when I think of Virgil and Seneca, if they might have been, you know, there's oral traditions that get passed down in a very healthy way among, you know, and like in India, you know, there's many layering. So we 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 get a rich history that comes down to us because of that. One more quote I want to read that feeds into that, and it, and it's and it comes towards uh, then. It, after this period comes 2200, what, we, we, what we're going to now call, or, you, or you're defining as the Middle Bronze Age. There was once a fortune-favored period when the boundaries of nature lay open to all for men's indiscriminate use before avarice, avarice, I should say, avarice and luxury had broken the bonds that held mortals together. Well, that's really not very archaeological or anthropological. Uh, no, nobody believes that anymore. It's not that uh, it, uh, the fields are open to everybody. These were very clearly de uh, defined societies. There's a, uh, a book that's going to be uh, published in uh, uh, this January or February and distributed by the University of Chicago Press. It's one of the great, it, it, it was the first anthropological study of the origins of money called the origins of money, uh, but it was auf Deutsch by a German uh, a a anthropologist uh, uh, who uh, went throughout the uh, German colonies of the uh, South Pacific uh, and also uh, in Africa, looking at uh, how did these, uh, what he called them indigenous uh, economy, is, uh, how did the indigenous societies operate? Well, there was ba they were basically uh, a, a, a stability, uh, a, an equality. I guess you could say the ethic is. I've heard Australians say uh, the the, uh, the the nail that stands up gets pounded down. Uh, the, the idea was that if people are richer, lording it over other people, that's considered antisocial, uh, and they're shunned. Well, what uh, uh, the German anthropologist uh, found, Heinrich Schütz, Schütz. Uh, was that uh, the source of instability came with foreign trade. And he said, well, we're calling this money because uh, what people used as a measure of wealth, uh, this is not a, a, really a, a goods in exchange. Uh, what people call primitive money was not money for barter. It's not money for buying goods and services. It's a form of wealth. And money has always been uh, uh, in the West. It's all we, it is evolved into uh, not an administrative uh, organization of a smoothly running society. It's uh, an acquisition of wealth. And uh, Schutz uh, realized that uh, the uh, what was pre that these 
items of wealth were number one most of them were foreign you'd get them from foreign traders and uh somehow and that would be uh, a prestige item uh or they would be maybe furniture or clothing of uh one of the leaders of a famous uh a, a well uh well-known uh, clan uh head well you had the same thing that uh mo uh mo mouse uh m-a-u-s-s -S, uh, found in uh in western canada uh where you you had the uh native americans he found th their uh form of wealth was coppers in other words copper supplied by the uh, uh the hudson bay company uh there uh, there and just like today uh somehow people value uh something foreign as an exotic is a form of wealth and that this became uh tended to become uh a source of instability and inequality and if you once you had inequality uh that built up uh, more and more so what did what did how did these uh archaic indigenous communities avoid that well for one thing uh if you had uh fancy uh, uh, uh silver or maybe even gold or shells or, or artwork or weapons they would be buried with the uh with uh, the owner the advantage of uh burying wealth with the owner is it wasn't handed down to the family to enable one family to accumulate wealth and get richer and richer than other families because as we know that any time a family inherits wealth uh the iq of their children drops at uh, 10 percent and after about uh four generations of living off trust funds uh you know they're they end up morons uh basically and uh, archaic societies wanted to avoid uh this uh, kind of uh, uh this idea of uh inheriting wealth and then thinking you don't have to work and then thinking oh other people are going to take the wealth away from me how do I prevent them from doing that that whole ethic uh, uh was uh not uh, uh would have destroyed archaic communities and polarized them and prevented them uh, from developing and in fact but, but, what's interesting there though Michael is and I'm thinking of Seoul on the wise, but I don't want to go that far north. I want to stay back now into the Middle Bronze Age. Okay. And so after the early Bronze Age, this fairly idyllic period, you end up having administrators who might be chiefdoms or chiefs in some small way that tend to, within their own tribe, want to take advantage of their own people and put people in debt. And how... Could you talk about we have no indication that they, they were chieftains at all they were called big men and uh we have uh, uh we, we have the cuneiform records of uh families uh uh there were some families in the middle bronze age uh we know that got got very rich they accumulated some land their families had it uh this maybe lasted 75 even 100 years and then all of a sudden we don't see the families anymore in their wealth so uh you you would have in, uh individuals and families uh getting rich we we have their records uh, uh i know mark van de Mira up at columbia university uh, did much of his research on one of these families uh and uh, uh we see we see them developing they were called big men they were creditors then all of a sudden uh somehow they lost uh it was taken away from them and I guess uh you had the middle late brown days saying we cannot afford some families to have so much wealth impoverishing other people because if we let that happen then the whole economy is going to end up uh with the population being uh working as debt debt bond servants to uh the creditors and they'll have all the land and uh you get to the situation that Isaiah and the Greek uh the uh Judaic prophets uh, uh denounced you'll uh, put house to house and land the land until there's no room for the population there anymore in that middle period too is there a learning then back earlier we have the sense of land tenure and your shift and you you get a plot of land to work each year and you know, or maybe that stays for some years maybe even maybe more than a generation or so but it's a land tenure arrangement and it's not property. How does ownership and property evolve then? And is that happening during the Middle basically, Ages to 1600? Basically by the foreclosure process. 
as, as long as the uh, having a plot of land, a standardized plot of land, land uh, well, there, uh, 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 there are two kinds of property in uh, uh, Mesopotamia. One was townhouses. Uh, people didn't need the townhouses to live, and that was sort of a prestige house. Townhouses were not subject to uh, the redistribution uh, uh, at the uh, clean slate, but uh, agricultural self-support land. Uh, that was the one that was actually subject to land tenure, and uh, the land te the land was uh, came with the liability uh, to pay, as I said, uh, to pay the taxes. If you were not any longer serving in the army or uh, working on corvée project, you could pay somebody to do it. Uh, but the idea was you were supposed to keep this land uh, in the hands of families. However, uh, once you begin to have private credit develop, private creditors, uh, they tended to want to keep the land for themselves. And every clean slate law from uh, Hammurabi's uh, dynasty all the way to the very last uh, of uh, Hammurabi's dynasty, just before uh, 1600 BC, when uh, uh, Babylon was uh, uh, defeat, defeated, Ami Sadaka, uh, Hammurabi's great-great-great-grandson, uh, you, you have uh, a lo longer and longer and longer clean slates for what to do when large uh, uh, creditors uh, try to avoid these uh, land distributions. And uh, the, one of the things already in uh, uh, around uh, the, the 17th, uh, 16th century BC, you would have uh, Babylonian creditors have their debtors say, uh, I, if, if the ruler uh, proclaims a clean slate, uh, this uh, contract is immune to it. Well, this is exactly what uh, Rabbi Hillel uh, did in uh, Judea uh, with a prose bull, saying, you know, I'm, uh, despite the fact that the, ju that the Jubilee year, the year of the Lord, is the very center of Jewish religion, uh, uh, this contract is stronger. Uh, my greed is stronger than the whole Jewish religion, and we're going to create rabbis that are going to take over the religion and make it a creditor religion and get rid of all the uh, the old Jewish religion that Jesus is preaching. Uh, you you had exactly you had the fight that occurred uh, the uh, the failed attempt by creditors to carve out their ability to foreclose on land and saying this land is now mine and my family and uh, for generation after generation. Uh, they didn't win that fight in uh, Middle Bronze Age uh, Babylonia, uh, but the creditors in the second century, first century, second century uh, BC in Judea did win the fight, and uh, they became uh, in Luke uh, chapter four uh, describes uh, the uh, Pharisees as fighting against Jesus when he goes to the temple and unrolls the scroll of Isaiah and said, you know, I've come to proclaim uh, uh, the year of the Lord, the Jubilee year, and uh, we're going to uh, revive uh, this practice of uh, canceling uh, the personal debts and freeing the bond servants. Uh, the, uh, uh, you had the, uh, the rabbinical school, the, the, uh, fighting against all that, saying, you know, uh, we've taken over the Jewish church and uh, we're the rich people and we're going to rewrite uh, 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 Jewish law uh, to, uh, uh, you know, against these uh, uh, archaic uh, uh, Christians and uh, they went to the Roman leader to put Jesus to death. Well, the same thing happened in later Christianity when uh, uh, the, the Roman Christian church wanted to get rid of everything that was uh, original in uh, uh uh, in Christianity, the the abhorrence of interest charges uh, and the uh, idea of debt cancellation, and uh, you had uh, Christianity hijacked uh, by uh, Saint Augustine uh, that said, "No, when uh, the uh, uh, the Lord's Prayer said, uh, forgive them their debts, just as we forget the debtors." Augustine said, "No, no, he didn't mean money debt. He meant sin." He meant the sin, the sin born with Adam. It's really sexual, uh, uh, sexual uh, uh, egotism. Uh, and uh, you, you all have that sin. Uh, and yes, there is redemption, uh, but it's not by forgiving debts. The redemption is you give the money to the church and we'll bless you. And uh, that way you get uh, to go to heaven by paying us. Uh, that, that was not exactly what Jesus was uh, talking about. Yeah, I think back when you get to the Christianity, it for me it 
it gets really difficult. I grew up a Catholic, and 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 the and the notion of uh, Christ saying, "Put your put your material goods." You know, if you're rich, take your goods, put them put them in front of the church, and let the poor people come and take them. And that that was. <laughs> it's almost too idealistic. <laughs> Put them in front of the church and let the priest take them, and we're going to get rich. Yeah, well, the priests are or the poor, so we got to figure yeah. that one out. <laughs> and Peter Brown has written about Augustine. Uh, he's he's the great uh, uh, British uh, yeah, biblical historian of uh, uh, Augustine's era. He 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 points that out that when the uh, about by the fourth century, when the Christian Church talked about the poor, they meant the the church officials who like oh we're all poor as church mice uh but the high church officials were of course the wealthy wealthy families okay yeah very good i i want to keep going and but i'm i'm thinking we we have about 15 more minutes we want to honor your time um but we have so much more to go. And what I'm thinking is maybe we can let the let some questions come yeah. in. And then in and then but we 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 we've all we still got another two, three thousand years to go, Michael. So we gotta have you back. <laughs> we want we you and I had worked this out to Constantinople and we're a little bit short. <laughs> yeah. So Let's take some questions, and I'm going to work on a time to invite you back, if that's okay. Okay. Um, John has a question. Thanks so much, Michael. I really enjoyed reading your book, And Forgive Them Their Debts. It covers much of the territory that you've been talking about today, but it left me with a question. <clears throat> and the question is this. As you point out, uh, this testimony against usury appears in Mosaic Law. Uh, but it's clear that, and and what you argue is that they picked up this notion essentially from their Babylonian captivity in Mesopotamia, where they saw the system not working very well without having to do the debt jubilee. My question is, did was there a testimony against the the, the usury against interest? in Mesopotamia itself, or was that something that the Jews really invented themselves in reaction to what they saw in Mesopotamia? It was the, la the latter. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the mentality in Mesopotamia is, well, interest is a fact of life. Uh, uh, if you borrow, uh, you, you are going to have to pay uh, interest because that's how it's organized. Uh, and some people uh, uh, borrow and uh, other people lend. The important thing is we can't let this unit, this natural human phenomenon, uh, uh, derange uh, the social order. So yes, we can have uh, interest-bearing debt as long as we cancel it regularly, uh, and so uh, we, we cancel it before it can lead to a transformation of the organization of society from uh, a uh, a balanced economy into an oligarchy. Uh, and uh, by the time you had the, uh, in classical antiquity, the idea of a banning of interest, this was not only in Christianity, this, and that was not only in Islam. Uh, you have, uh, by the fourth century AD, uh, you had all the way to Persia, you, you had uh, very many different uh, religious groups. They, there was a whole general revulsion against conspicuous wealth. Uh, there was just a thing, oh my God, look what it's done to us. Look how it's impoverished the population. Look at how tr it's trivialized uh, uh, social uh, balance. And it's uh, uh, so they uh, prevented interest itself, not uh, letting it, realizing that uh, let it develop it, you cancel it before it gets too big. You borrow some money, uh, it, you, you pay it back in the normal course of affairs. But when it gets so large that it's not the normal course of affairs anymore, we're in a completely uh, 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 quantity turns into quality. Uh, th there's that kind of a change. Thanks very much. That's kind of what I had gathered in reading the book, but it wasn't quite clear enough. But now you've made it clear. Thank you. That's the right question to ask. You're absolutely right. Carl, you have your hand up. We'll give you a question, and uh, let's 
We'll keep it very general if possible, or general to this conversation. Go ahead, Carl, thank you. Uh, unmute. Carl, yeah, he has it. Sorry, sorry about that. Uh, Dr. Hudson, uh, well, actually branching off, but connected to your, your mentioning of the influence of uh, theology in the uh, monetary and uh, debt issue, uh, you've spoken previously about uh, the Crusades being used not, not just to, excuse me, I'm a bit congested, to make war upon uh, Islam, but also other Christian sects that were not submissive to the papacy. And concerning the interaction of the three, quote, uh, monotheistic religions, the complexity of how when the Jesuits came into being as a military order, literally to make war on the Reformed churches, uh, their leader among the founders were Talmudic Jews. And it makes me wonder about whether even with the Roman church, whether early in its history, it may have been infiltrated, co-opted for use by the Pharisees, essentially as controlled opposition to uh, you know, further a long-term strategy of accumulating wealth, uh, indebting the, you know, the rest of the world as is mandated in Deuteronomy. And the one question about Deuteronomy that you may or may not be familiar with, the historic writings of, uh, of uh, Douglas Reed, his book, The Controversy of Zion, he alludes to his, uh, biblical scholars agreeing that Deuteronomy was actually crafted during the Babylonian exile as uh, really a political strategy for uh, continued organization of the their tribe upon their return to Jerusalem. At, and it was just simply portrayed as having been written at the time of Moses, when it was in fact written much much later. Well, obviously Thank you, Carl. the whole of the Bible was uh, written upon the return from exile, and they put there were all these different traditions that they wove together. Uh, so yes, uh, that makes sense. But uh, it's all nobody's been able to figure out uh, how uh, Deuteronomy came uh, in, in contrast to Leviticus. Was it just the in, idea of some people, uh, some individual? Uh, because we don't have uh, cuneiform records uh, on clay from that period in uh, uh, Judea and Israel, we don't have any. Uh, uh, we really don't know uh, uh, more than uh, uh, we can uh, we can reconstruct. But they, most people do think it was all, it was certainly edited uh, on the return from exile. But I want to get back to uh, your, your first question uh, about uh, within the Catholic Church and what happened there. Uh, it didn't happen that way. Uh, you, uh, you, you have uh, what the uh, Vatican official history, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, there were five patriarchates, uh, pa uh, patriarchates of Christianity uh, by the uh, 10th and, uh, century BC. You had the chief patriarchate uh, was a Eastern Christian Orthodoxy in uh, Constantinople. And allied to that were three other patriarchates, Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem. There was a, a fifth patriarchate, and that was the original one, that was Rome. But that was the least important at all, because uh, as the Catholic uh, histories uh, des describe, that's called the pornocracy, uh, the rule of the, uh, uh, the, you could say, the prostitutes. Uh, the, uh, uh, it was uh, the, the, the uh, Roman papacy was controlled by a, a small group of uh, two or three families from Tusculum, which was a suburb of uh, Rome. And uh, that family, they, uh, uh, all over uh, Italy, local families would ap uh, appoint the head of the church, just as they'd appoint the local sheriff uh, or other uh, dignitaries. Uh, the uh, the uh, Roman church had been completely privatized. And uh, the, this uh, created such a revulsion in uh, outside of Italy uh, that the Germans uh, took the lead and uh, said we've got to revive the papacy we've got to uh, we've got to bring rome back into the sphere of christianity uh and how do we do that uh we, we've got to make uh, new rules and we've got these rules have got to be very very strict we're not going to let uh, uh priests get married anymore that was a, a very different from how the other four other patriarchates were 
uh, we they had we we've got uh, the Germans insisted in having uh, their own view of the Trinity uh, that uh, was quite different from the rest of the uh, uh, Christians, and so uh, essentially by uh, the first thing they did was saying, well, if we've got to say uh, we've we've redefined Christianity. Uh, they said Constantinople is no longer the key. That was the break in 10, 1054, uh, where they uh, they excommunicated Constantinople. And then by about 10, 1054, uh, you had uh, followers, uh, uh, you, you had uh, the popes developing what you, was called the papal dictates. Uh, by Hildebrand uh, was uh, the main uh, sponsor of all this. Uh, he became pope. And uh, you have these papal dictates saying how Rome can take over not only their, all the other Catholic churches, Christian churches that they called Catholic, uh, but also all of the secular kingdoms. It was a plan for world domination, or at least the domination of all Christendom. And uh, so uh, all this was laid out in great detail. I'm writing a book about this period uh, right now. I've been working on it for the last few years. It's uh, incredibly detailed. Well, the problem is that uh, the Pope, how are you going to uh, take over all the rest of the uh, churches? Well, uh, the popes didn't have an army. Uh, uh, but so what did they do? Uh, they, there, well, there was a floating army that had come down the Normans. Uh, and they'd come uh, warlords. And so uh, the popes made deals. The first deal was Robert Wiscard, who was a warlord in southern Italy and uh, 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 the Sicily, and said, we'll make you king of Sicily and, and southern Italy if you'll uh, pled, uh, pledge fealty to the pope and you will make your kingdom uh, a fiefdom of the room. Uh, then uh, we'll back you and we'll make you king. You just have to give us uh, a fight your army for us. Wiesgaard said, yes, that worked well. And then they found another warlord, uh, uh, and that was William the Conqueror. And they made a deal with him. We'll uh, appoint you king of England, and we'll excommunicate uh, all the people who are against you. If you make, you know, pledge fealty to us, you make, uh, Eng you make uh, England a fiefdom of Rome. And he agreed. Uh, and then they... Uh, uh, essentially, the, the, uh, this was in the middle of the 11th century. Finally, uh, the, uh, the in the uh, 1090s, they, they mounted the Crusades, uh, and the Crusades were nominally uh, to sort of uh, help or merge or uh, have a relationship with Constantinople. We know that they ended up looting Constantinople, uh, but uh, this uh, essentially uh, unified uh, the Western Christian de Christendom, and uh, the uh, um, immediately the uh, the popes uh, worked with the English kings and Guiscard uh, saying, "How do we uh, how do we kill everybody who doesn't agree with us? How do we? Uh, it's necessary for you to hate all the Christians that are not part of our church and be willing to kill them." So uh, the, the, uh, there were two big uh, uh, inquisit uh, basically a destruction. Uh, mo most of the fighting was against the Germans because the Germans were not uh, warlords. That, they were a well-organized kingdom. The, uh, uh, the uh, German king was the Holy Roman Empire, Emperor, uh, and it was an elective. Uh, he was elected. It wasn't just a, a, a family that was going into decay like you had in the subsequent uh, uh, British and uh, Western Christian uh, kingships. Uh, and so uh, the the popes uh, went essentially to King John's uh, son, Henry III, and said, you know, we want you to go to war uh, against Germany, and mostly they want, we want you to go to war uh, against uh, southern Italy, where the Byzantine church, the Christian Orthodox Church has taken over, and where there are Islamics, and uh, uh, we, we want you to go to war with them, and that requires uh, borrowing money. Uh, you've got, to, uh, and we've arranged uh, with bankers. Uh, we've uh, we've decided to abolish the core of Christianity. We're no longer going to oppose usury. Usury is us. Uh, we're blessing the bankers. We're excommunicating people that oppose uh, raising war debts. Uh, if if uh, these debts are taken on to fight a religious war for God by killing people who don't uh, accept Catholicism. 
Uh, and so you had uh, the the barons uh, rebelled against uh, uh, Henry the uh, Third. They were the they passed the uh, uh, Westminster and London rules. There was a civil war there, and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, Henry agreed he agreed to what the barons said. But then he went to uh, uh, the Pope and said, "What do you excommunicate all of the people, the barons who oppose me?" The, the baron excommunicated them. An earlier uh, pope had uh, uh, the same thing. When King John uh, had wanted to uh, essentially raise war to fight, the barons uh, drew up the Magna Carta in 1215. Uh, he promised uh, not to uh, uh, do anything to try to uh, oppose this, but he immediately went uh, to the Pope, uh, uh, Innocent the Third, will you uh, will you excommunicate everybody who disagrees with me? And Innocent uh, uh, did. Uh, uh, the Pope excommunicated them, and uh, there was a, uh, against the war. So uh, you you had the the papacy itself uh, in order to enable uh, the warlords to fight uh, first against Christianity uh, and then against uh, uh, sort of the real Christians, uh, the Cathars in southern France. You remember the singing nun. That's all about the founder of the Inquisition, uh, Dominic, say, uh, the Dominicans. The Dominicans were there uh, and said, you have to kill everybody who disagrees with this. This is what Roman Christianity is all about. That's what makes us different from the other Christians. We're willing to die for what we believe. Well, that's uh, so they 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 all of a sudden they uh, sanctified the charging of usury. They uh, and uh, uh, excommunicated its opponents, and so the the interest bearing debt uh, it was put back into the center of society uh, by uh, the, the uh, North Italian and Transalpine bankers. Uh, sponsored by the papacy. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you, Carl, too. Before we give Joe the last question, um, we're, 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 we're basically out of time. And I, I want, I, I think Michael needs to get to other things uh, shortly, too. But um, I want to bookmark things for um, eight. Well, first for classical, early in classical Greece, I'd like to bring that up at some point. And then I'd also like to bring up the uh, era of Ptolemy in ancient Egypt. I, I find that uh, fascinating, too, in terms of how banking and other things develop along those lines. But this was one conversation for everybody and for Michael. I did not want to rush it. And I am greatly, greatly, greatly thankful uh, uh, to Michael, because this is not history um, we'll get often. So, Joe, for today, you get you get the last question. Well, I see we are just a bit of time. So let me just say that was spectacular, Professor Hutton, uh, as always. And uh, you have to be one of the most eclectic economists uh, in the world. And I'm sure that uh, John Meir and Keynes would have loved to have you as a colleague. Thank you very much. It was terrific. Thank you. I'm not sure if Michael would want Keynes, though, as a colleague. <laughs> a colleague. He did what he could, uh, given the fact that he was a Treasury official. Sure. I mean, uh, when uh, I, I don't agree with his analysis. He was a po uh, I'm a classical economist, basically. I think the 19th century developed the concept of value and economic rent as unearned income. Uh, whether it's uh, uh, bank income or land, uh, land rent or monopoly rent, uh, they developed the key concepts that uh, all were sort of overthrown by the financial, uh, the, the, the banking class uh, saying there's no such thing as unearned income. There's no economic rent. Everybody earns whatever they have. Uh, uh, I, I think that uh, I'm trying to get the, I wish the bricks would rediscover the wheel and uh, go back to what uh, the 19th century was all about as they uh, restructured uh, their economy. So I guess you'd well, say that well, Keynes was Keynes, not Keynes did want to euthanize the rentier. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Okay. Thanks, Joe. Um, we have a real quick question. Um, Eric, if it's real quick, we, we're out of time. We were, well, we're at the moment. So you wanted to, uh, Eric, say, uh, you have a quick question. Michael Hudson, oh, this is from the Philippines. Um, as a former seminary aspirant in the Catholic Church, 
uh, I've been aware about the Judeo-Christian relation and, and usually in the past centuries was condemned by the Catholic Church. So now it's not tolerated and the Vatican is the loots of financial corruption. I, I, I understand about what you talk about this kind and I've read your book partly, uh, but the, the significance of this is necessary at the present moment about our present book. Not slowly, not slowly. it's a bad thing. All right? Yeah, yeah, I, I'm done, yes. Well, thank I, you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We'll have to speak. Can you, can you tell me what his question was? What's the relationship? It's the relationship of the uh, of the Pharisees to the um, uh, of the temple of the financiers uh, during the time of Jesus. We know Jesus Christ uh, did not mention anything about usury, and and the church, however, condemned it. Uh, in the past century, as we studied in the seminary, but the church now is tolerating usury, and the Vatican is now the deluge of financial corruption. Uh, that's only my question. What What about the Vatican again? Say your last part again. We didn't hear uh, the Vatican is now the deluge in full of financial corruption, and we wonder why it's really happening in 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 the church when Jesus. Uh, well, uh, Jesus condemned uh, the, the money changers of the temple. You mentioned that how oh, Jesus whipped the money changers of the temple. So um, I wonder the very connection of the Pharisees with the financiers at the time of Jesus, uh, where it seems that the greed for money uh, was very common among the uh, so-called uh, Pharisees uh, of the temples. That's all. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. No longer what it was before. Uh, when I was in my uh, 30, back in, back in the 1960s and 70s, uh, uh, the Vatican was my, uh, uh, the Catholic Church was my major uh, supporter. My first uh, book on uh, the myth of foreign aid was published by the Marinol uh, brothers, uh, King Cardinal Spellman's. Uh, order and they were sponsoring everything. Uh, you know what I was doing. Essentially, I was providing the arguments for liberation theology. Uh, that if you're not going to cut the population uh, back, uh, then you need land reform. Uh, land reform is uh, a precondition for letting uh, the population grow. And uh, the uh, Vatican was supporting uh, all of what I was uh, writing in uh, on this. They were sending me around the country. I was writing for. Uh, Catholic uh, periodicals. Uh, the new uh, 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 John Paul I was going to establish an academy of geoeconomics. But then he he was poisoned or whatever, and you had the two popes from hell, uh, man, and they uh, essentially followed uh, the Opus Dei group. They they uh, erased the whole liberation theology group. Now you have uh, Francis as Pope, but I don't. Uh, everybody that I was dealing with in the Vatican before, including uh, you know the Foreign Secretary, uh, they're all died of old age. It's not the '60s anymore, uh, and uh, I don't have any contacts there. I would uh, I would love to have uh, Francis uh, do uh, uh, issuing a papal encyclical on uh, de uh, de de debt cancellation, the Lord's Prayer. What, do what does it mean about forgiving the debt? Look at the debt problems we have today with the Global South uh, and the uh, countries uh, uh, being uh, uh, crucified on a uh, uh, cross of gold and dollars. Uh, but uh, uh, it's no longer the same Vatican that it was uh, back then. And uh, I don't have any associations with them anymore. Thank, thank you, Eric. Thank you, Michael. We're five minutes over. So uh, I want to ask for a special dispensation on that. <laughs> and, and, and just to thank you again, Michael. If everyone who, if you're around and you want to raise your hands or just quietly say thank you, uh, we're, we're very appreciative. I wish I could have been there like I used to be. Yeah, I know. I wish if we were in person, we, this would be a great moment. And, um, uh, but this is a great moment. So we thank you very much. And we hope to have you back uh, to continue these historical stories. And um, and it's that how to treat. It's that caring. For, what I was thinking about uh, 
early the early Bronze Age as a caring economy. And and when I hear your words on jubilee and debt forgiveness and land tenure versus property and the idea of contractual law and things that, that we need to put into question today and where where do we need to go today because it seems like we are pretty close to a cliff. And how do we walk away from this uh, and uh, so we don't fall over, so to speak? So yeah. you but your words are good and and um, you give us you give us hope. So thank you, Michael. Well, thanks so much for inviting me, Stephen. Okay. I'm gonna tell you uh thank you in my Eskimo language. So here it comes. Egumsi Kanaholic. And that means thank you for spending time with us in Siberian Yupik in an Eskimo language. So, Igumsi Kanaholic. Thank you very much, Michael. Well, well thank you. I hope you're uh, tape recording this so the Europeans are asleep right now. Uh <laughs> no, no, it, it will be. And your early recording is out, and uh this will be out. I'm uh, I don't want to make a promise because I may I got one out last week and I'm getting I'm getting okay yet, but no, no, we've this is recorded and this will go into pos posterity. So thank you. This what will be a legacy can, for you. <laughs> what more can one ask for? Well, thanks, Stephen. Okay, thank you. Bye bye for now, Michael. Yep. Okay. Um, okay, we have, um, let's go for.